begin transmission. For a while now, right outside our habitat, we have a little bucket filled with fruit and other kind of um, potential food sources for animals and a little camera trap. So whenever something comes and investigates, we can see what kind of creatures we have living around us. So far, we've mostly collected a lot of insects and a few, a few reptiles of can't come and um, investigate the fruit pile. But yesterday, we got something, uh, just a spectacular creature. And we caught it on a film, and here is this, uh, this particular creature is, is just fantastic. So take a look at this guy. He gets really excited about the fruit. <laughs> and, he, and he falls over a little bit. He's just a goofy look at, he only has two legs. He can't really walk very well, and he gets super excited, and he's just pretty adorable. We're calling this little guy um, Nathan, and he is a kiwi bird. And uh, Nathan is just this adorable, uh, sweet little bird. He's got a nice long beak with um, two nostrils at the very end, which are very, it's very unusual. Um, he's a bird, which is, um, he doesn't fly. He kind of scampers around the undergrowth, like you see here. And uh, he kind of, his feathers aren't really flight feathers. They're kind of more, almost like mammalian hair, actually. Um, but keeps him warm. And he rummages around at night looking for um, some fruit, maybe some earthworms, some uh, insects to eat. And he's our little adorable camp pet now. Uh, kiwis lay eggs. And they have um, apparently one of the largest eggs per body mass ratio of any animal um, I've ever seen. Here's a picture of what it looks like before um, they give birth to this, before they lay this egg, and it takes up about 30% of the internal, um, or it, it takes up 30% of their weight uh, when it, once it's fully mature. So the female kiwi, once the egg is this large, can't eat, um, and it, I, I can't imagine giving birth to this kind of egg. Again, not giving birth. Uh, hatching this gigantic egg. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the way the kiwis, kiwis live their lives. So uh, today we'll talk about um, no more kiwis, because we're done talking about kiwis, but we'll talk about the relatives, um, all the rest of the birds. Birds are really remarkable creatures. They are often um, elaborately colored and they have intricately designed nests. Um, they perform fantastically complex mating rituals. And for, uh, for centuries, for millennia, people have enjoyed watching birds. Um, they are masters of the air, and they can soar, they can glide, they can, they can swim even with their wings. They are an incredibly diverse group. They are found in class Aves, which contains about 10,000 uh, species. And they inhabit every ecosystem on Earth, except for the deep ocean but there are quite a few almost um, entirely marine species that will only come to land um, once a year to lay eggs. So they inhabit Antarctica, Antarctic, tropics, deserts, forests, um, rainforests, and everywhere in between. A very um, interesting and diverse group. And as you know, they share a lineage, an ancestral lineage with um, crocodiles, the crocodilians, and they both arise from an Archosaurian ancestor way back in uh, the Triassic. And if you notice this right here, the KPG boundary, the, the boundary between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, all of our happy little dinosaurs go extinct. And then immediately, all of these modern bo bird orders appear, almost um, in relative speaking, uh, very, very suddenly. And you get almost all the modern diversity in a very, very short amount of time. Um, Birds um, share a lot of similarities with other reptiles. As we know, they have diapsid skulls. They have a um, uh, beta keratin scales, um, except their scales are modified into feathers. And we also see this one lineage of dinosaurs, the theropods, which are gonna include animals like um, Velociraptor and T-Rex. And then this little guy here, the Manoraptor, um, there are some theropods that have been found with feathers. And so birds aren't the only animals with feathers. We tend to think of feathers as being unique synapomorphies of aves, but that's not really true. There are plenty of dinosaur theropod-like animals that also had feathers. 
We don't really know what they used their feathers for because most of them weren't flight feathers, but they have, might have used them for gliding or for territorial or mating displays or maybe some type of cryptid um, coloration to or as camouflage. It's, it's really unsure. And so the actual evolution of flight is still um, a mystery. There are lots of different ideas. Uh, but one thing I want to point out that's somewhat contrary to um, this story where you have kind of reptilian ancestors, modern birds, and then bird, um, animals like Archaeopteryx that have traits of both that are kind of intermediate. And if you look at Manoraptor here, that seems to represent another intermediate form. But um, I do want to point out that intermediates should be intermediate in time between the reptiles and the birds. And unfortunately for the conventional um, time scale, there are modern birds with all the attributes of a modern bird dating way back in here in the Jurassic. So predating Archaeopteryx and a lot of the flight, the, the feathered um, dinosaurs. And so we, uh, that's part of what makes the evolution of birds so kind of mysterious still, is we don't have enough evidence to um, confidently say they evolved from animals like Archaeopteryx or like Manoraptor for sure. Um, but that's kind of the, the current hypothesis. This guy right here um, is a modern, basically a modern bird, no teeth, no tail, has a, has a keeled sternum, and he's way back in uh, the early Jurassic. So birds are, are pretty unique, <clears throat> but they're not completely unique because there are a lot of feathered dinosaurs as well. And we can look at this here. So this is, uh, this is a great example of why birds are considered dinosaurs because if you look at this phylogeny, um, Sericia, um, all these dinosaurs, and then these theropods, this is all paraphyletic. Each of these groups would be paraphyletic if you don't include birds. So to make a monophyletic group, phylogenetically speaking, uh, we group the birds in with all these other dinosaurs and make a nice monophyletic group. So um, you could interpret this as being um, convergent evolution. So uh, flight and feathers and all that stuff is a uh, good adaptation. And so maybe you had several reptilian theropod lineages um, adapting, evolving into uh, this convergently the same attributes that birds have. That's one possible explanation. Um, other possible explanation is that birds evolved from um, these feathered dinosaur-like creatures. But if you look at the synapomorphies of, uh, we're gonna look at primarily two main groups, the Paleognathus birds and the Neognathus birds. So the old jawed birds and the new jawed birds. And the main difference between these is gonna be um, their uh, flightedness. So neo Neognathan birds are all flight, well not all, but predominantly um, flighted and the Paleognathus birds are often flightless, <clears throat> and the Paleognathus birds include the ratites, which are um, ostriches and emus and, and those fast bipedal runners like that. Um, so that's a pretty big distinction there. And you notice here, we've got a good list of synapomorphies of um, Neornithes, or kind of what we're considering class Aves right here. These are, are fantastically um, horrible group of ex um, thankfully extinct birds called terror birds. And these terror birds were um, pursuit predators, as far as we can tell. They range from four feet to 12 feet tall in different species. And they would crunch up early mammals and reptiles and basically whatever. And birds are kind of terrifying if they get big and they get predatory and they get um, after you. So thankfully, a lot of birds are um, a lot of terror birds are extinct. So what makes a bird a bird? The obvious thing are wings and feathers. And as we've mentioned, um, there are some feathered dinosaurs with wings and feathers, but um, as far as extant organisms, birds are the only ones with these very unique um, structures. So wings and feathers. Wings are primarily used for flight in the vast majority of birds, but some species, the birds, um, use their or have very very underdeveloped wings like you think about an ostrich who primarily uses the wings for mating displays or like the kiwi who barely has any wings at all um, and then some other birds have adapted for uh, swimming so if you think about a cormorant or a penguin they primarily use their feathers as insulation and their wings for swimming penguins like this this little baby penguin 
So uh, not all wings are used for flight, but um, all birds have wings. Birds also have keratinized beaks. And why would they have keratinized beaks? So um, this is going to be an uh, important question because if you think about the what makes birds birds, it's going to be flight. And their whole morphology and physiology is structured around making them good flyers. And so what is the benefit of a, a jaw with calcium teeth versus a jaw with a keratinized beak? Well, uh, think about weight. So uh, calcified teeth are heavier and um, birds don't really chew anyway. And so um, it's much lighter, so more efficient flying to have a keratinized beak. And I think that's why I have by birds have beaks. So modern birds don't have teeth, although you have some um, extinct birds and ancient um, lineages that do have teeth, modern birds lack teeth. That doesn't mean they always use their beaks for rending, tearing into flesh. Some, some of them use their uh, pretty elaborately colored um, bills for eating fruit or leaves. Nobody really knows why the toucan's bill looks like that. Uh, it may be for radiating heat, actually, or it may be some type of display, um, but uh, we don't really know for sure. But it's a really remarkable structure. What they do put calcium in is not their teeth, it's their eggs. So um, in contrast to reptilian eggs, which are leathery, um, birds have calcified eggs that are have hard shells. And these shells are semi-permeable, so they prevent water loss, but they allow oxygen and other gases to be exchanged. Um, so the, they're pretty, pretty unique kind of shells. Uh, mammals don't really like eggs, and the eggs of snakes and lizards are leathery, and turtles are leathery. Uh, birds are the only extant group that lay hard calcium shelled eggs. So forcemet, snapmorphies, wings, feathers, beaks, and eggs. Birds are built for flight. That's what uh, that's what birds are known for. That's what they're specialized for. And so their their wings, um, their beaks, their eyes, their skeletons, their digestive system, everything is going to be adapted for flight. And uh, they don't often, some of them don't fly, like I was saying, the cormorants and penguins, they use their, their wings for swimming, or in this case, this little penguin's using his wings to bully his little friend there. Whack. <laughs> um, all right, so the feathers, feathers are, are really interesting structures and they're used for a lot of different things in birds. Some of them, like on the penguins, they're used for, um, to prevent water from getting to the skin. In others, they're elaborately colored for display, especially during mating season, but predominantly the feathers are used for flight. Oh, they can also be used for insulation, so, um, which is, I guess, kind of like the penguins, but you can, feathers can be used for water proofing, for insulation, keep you warm, for coloration, uh, camouflage and sexual displays, and finally for flight. This peacock feather is not going to be a flight feather. That's going to be for a mating display. This is kind of a typical flight feather. And the typical flight feather is asymmetrical. So it can, it can grab onto the wind and generate lift um, more easily. And so you can kind of infer the, the ability, uh, an animal's ability to fly by the presence of asymmetrical versus symmetrical wings. So most of the dinosaurs that um, have feathers, they have symmetrical feathers not asymmetrical feathers. Most flight birds have asymmetrical feathers. And these feathers are composed of beta keratin. So just like the scales of a snake or a lizard, they're made of the same type of structure. But um, rather than kind of um, as, the, as the epidermis is secreted, instead of making these flat like scales, the cell kind of curls and it creates a, um, a empty hollow tube that kind of spirals out. And it eventually, the, the whole structure is, is dead, um, so they don't feel um, necessarily, like if you cut the wing, just like if you cut a, cut a hair, if you cut a feather, if you cut the wing, they're, they're gonna feel that. But if you snip a feather, they're not really gonna feel that in the feather. The specific regions of the feather, the quill is what is extending out from the epidermis, so this is the quill. And then when the quill is mature, this uh, shaft right here is called the rachis. So we have the quill here, or the calamus here, and then the rachis extending out in the middle. And then protruding out from the rachis are barbs. 
And so each of these little lines is a barb, and there are hundreds um, of them on each side of the rachis. And collectively, this side is called a vein, and this side is called a vein. So we have veins on either side of the central rachis, and then we have barbs extending laterally from the rachis. And then extending laterally from each individual barb are barbules. And if you look closely, the barbules are kind of hooked, and they hook all the barbs together. So the, the rachis extends out, barbs extend out laterally from that, and then barbules extend out laterally from that, interlocking the um, barbs together and making a nice, powerful, air-resistant um, foil for flight. And when birds preen, um, uh, oftentimes they are kind of coating their, well, their removing parasites and they're applying some oil to their wings, but they're also kind of re-interlocking these little Velcro-like locks of the barbules so you get that nice firm wing. And now we'll just basically go through all the physiological systems of birds and talk about how they're specifically adapted for flight. So a bird's skeleton is going to be adapted for flight primarily by being incredibly lightweight. So you don't want a thick, heavy skeleton that you have to lug around the air. That's going to be um, too costly, energetically speaking. So you can accomplish lightening your skeleton um, several different ways. And uh, the most prominent way is with pneumatized bones. So pneuma means air. Pneumatized bones mean um, bones with air. So this is the inside of a bird's bone. Uh, it's not solid. It has all these little struts and air pockets. And so it's, it's strong, but it's, it's filled with air. And this allows, um, this doesn't weaken the bone too much uh, because again, there's gonna be a cost and a benefit here. You're gonna have a lightening of the bone, but you're also gonna have a weakening of the bone. So uh, by having these crisscrossing struts scattered throughout, you still provide some strength to the bone, but it's much, much more lightweight. Also, you're not gonna have teeth. You're gonna have more of a keratinized bill. And so here you can see a cross section of that hornbill uh, of the picture and you can see all the little air pockets. And there's just not a lot of chunky skeletal weight here. The, the, the skeletons really weigh a small fraction of their body weight, and so they're not lugging around uh, all, this, all this heavy bones. Now to generate uh, lift and powered flight, you're gonna have to have strong muscles, and those muscles are going to need to attach to something. And so in flighted animals, you're gonna have a keeled sternum. So the sternum is uh, what we cut through in the shark and the frog to get to the um, uh, pair to get to the heart um, eventually. And in birds, it has a huge keel on it, and this is for all the major flight muscles to attach. And then the furcula, this is a kind of a fused clavicle, and this one stores potential energy when the the bird is in flight. So again, if you just find a skeleton of an animal, you can infer whether it's flighted or not. You can look at the keel, and you can look at the furcula. You can look at, obviously, the, the, wing, the arm bones, if they're modified into wing shape. The backbones are all fused together, and so it's, it's nice structurally sound support, uh, and no really tail to speak of. And... Um, yeah, so that's how a bird skeleton is adapted for flight. Flight muscles, I mentioned that the flight muscles are going to attach to that keeled sternum. And you, you, have you ever seen a, a flock of geese flying like this in this nice little V shape? Sometimes one side is longer than the other. Do you know why that is? Because there's more geese on that side. And also just because geese aren't very good um, at symmetry. So uh, flight muscles, they can generate enough flight that the birds can fly for thousands of miles. There are some albatross species that will, will literally sleep while they're flying uh, because of how efficient their, their flight is. And so here we can see the, the keel of the sternum and we have two muscles that attach and these work antagonistically against each other. So this is a, the, the concept here of movement by antagonistic forces goes um, is found everywhere from clams to uh, worms to nematodes and insects to here. What I find particularly interesting about this is that the pectoralis major, 
muscle, when this contracts, you're going to pull the humerus down. So this is going to be the downstroke, and that's the that's the most powerful muscle in the bird's body. And this is going to what is going to initially generate lift. That's what they do when they're when they're taking off. And then the supracoracoideus muscle is also found on the anterior side attached to the keel of the sternum. And it has this little tendon that hooks around behind the humerus to pull it up this way whenever this contracts. And so it works antagonistically, and they're attached at different spots, but they both attach to the humerus. What kind of might make more sense is to have this muscle on the back, and so then when this pulls, and then this pulls, and it works like that. So uh, why is the supracoracoideus muscle on the front instead of on the back? Well, uh, this may be an adaptation to kind of keep the center of gravity in front, and so it helps them fly more um, aerodynamically, instead of having a kind of, if all they had gigantic back muscles and gigantic chest muscles, then they would be kind of like a bowling ball, which wouldn't be a very good aerodynamic um, flight. So uh, this structure probably helps them fly more efficiently through um, aerodynamics. Another interesting uh, feature of their, their muscles and tendons is their, their perching ability. They have a remarkable ability to um, passively grab onto things. So a lot of birds will sleep in trees, just like this cute little owl is doing, and they don't have to actively contract muscles in order to perch. Because what happens, they have a special tendon that runs down and attaches all their, all, all their talons together. And when they, when they rest, all of their body weight pushes down and it flexes this tendon right here, so it stretches it. And when this gets stretched, it gets pulled up. Automatically, this is going to pull, 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 and it's going to close the, the little talon around the branch. And so just by sitting down, you're stretching this, you know, can kind of think of this as a rubber band that becomes taut and then pulls on these claws and perching automatically happens. So you just have to sit down and your claws contract and keep you where you are. This also allows birds to passively hold on to prey that's um, substantially um, heavy, heavier than you might think they could carry because they're not actually having to uh, grip it tightly with a lot of active muscles. What do birds eat? Birds eat a whole lot of different things. This greedy little waxwing is eating as many little berries as um, he can fit into his mouth. Um, so you have some frugivores, you have some seed eaters, you have a whole bunch of insectivores that, that love to eat um, insects. Um, some of the, the most important predators of insects are birds, and they can eat millions in, um, well, I don't know, uh, I want to say a day, but millions in a day sounds, sounds pretty high. So I can say, I'll say millions in a week, that's, that's at least safe. And some of them are, are, are ver vertebrate predators or scavengers. This golden eagle is trying to take down a small deer. So don't underestimate the power of some of these large, powerful eagles. They can take down even some, some pretty substantial mammalian prey. This one is a pretty horrific killer. This is a, the butcher bird or the shrike. And sometimes you'll see these thorny acacia trees that are just covered with these uh, macabre visions of uh, torture. There are these little lizards and mice and um, other birds all impaled on the sharp spikes of the acacia tree. And this is done by this particular bird here, the shrike. And what they do is they find, um, they, they use this as kind of like a refrigeration. So they, they grab a grab a rodent or a mouse and they impale him while they're still alive and then they use that kind of like a butcher's hook and from there they can rip flesh away but also it's they, they can store it for later so if there's an abundance of prey items and they collect a bunch they'll just stab them on there and keep them for weeks at a time because then they're safe from all the ground predators that might scavenge them so if you're ever wandering around to see an acacia tree that's full of dead decomposing small animals it is a shrike's lair. And this, I can't help but talk about pelicans. Pelicans typically eat fish, but they are kind of trash eaters. They'll eat anything. And this is one that just decided to eat a pigeon. He's just walking around and thinks, oh, I'll eat this pigeon, and just eats it. And you see the little pouch that usually is used to 
hold water and then fish, just swallowed it whole. I mean, that little bird is still alive. <laughs> She's got the great greatest reaction to this. Yeah, so pelicans, pelicans are, are crazy, crazy animals. <clears throat> Can will eat just about anything. And they use their specialized beaks to eat these things. So the pelicans have this um, fantastic pouch and large beak to scoop up water and fish within it. You can classify the beaks of birds into two broad categories, urophagus and stenophagus. Most birds are going to have stenophagus beaks. This means specialized. Um, urophagus me beaks are more general uh, beaks. They're kind of all purpose. So gro crows are a good example of a urophagus beak. They can eat nuts and they can scavenge prey. They can eat insects. Um, they can um, dig for worms. They can do a um, whole lot of things with their all-purpose urophagus beak. Stenophagus beaks are much more common and they're gonna include things like flamingos, which use their beaks to filter water for little bits of algae as they kind of drink upside down. And avocets, which use their nice, uh, long, cylindrical, upturned beak to dig for little marine worms in their burrows. Or like parrots that use their really large chompers here that are heavily muscularized to um, chomp open the shells of nuts. Yep, uh, parrots maybe look kind of predatory. They have this nice hooked bill, but they, they just need all that strength to break open their um, the shells of the walnuts and stuff that they eat. And then you have things like the spoon bill, which uses a spoon-shaped bill to kind of um, sift through the water looking for small fish or crustaceans to eat. And those guys hunt. You can see his arms kind of held over his head. Sometimes birds like this will stand in one spot for a very long time with this little umbrella look. And uh, what they're doing is fish will seek out places of shade when they know their predator is around. And so the bird is basically creating its own little shady spot for the fish to come and seek shelter under and then they eat them. And then on the far right, we have a harpy eagle. And there you have that nice um, beak with the, the rending, tearing part for ripping flesh from bones. And the harpy eagle is a primate specialist um, eagle. And so it can eat howl howler monkeys and other kinds of monkeys in trees. Most of the time you can tell you can kind of infer what a bird eats by the morphology of its of its bill. So you can kind of tell a predator versus a herbivore um, most of the time. This one's a, kind of an exception. This is a really interesting looking bird called a Dracula parrot. And the Dracula parrot, what do you think it eats? It looks predatory, right? It's got that hooked bill. Uh, but this is actually a specialized fig eater. So there's a, a specific kind of fruit that, um, that needs this kind of bill to break open. And so it's very good at eating figs, um, even though it looks pretty intimidating. So Dracula parrot is kind of an exception to that general rule. The woodpecker's bill is adapted for drilling into wood, and it just slams its head into, into pine trees looking for grubs to eat, which is just, just a remarkable way to go about eating food. So you find something, you hear something that sounds delicious to you, and then you just wail on the protective trunk with your with your face. And so uh, woodpeckers have all kinds of adaptations to prevent getting concussions. They have this spongy little area in their skull. So when their brain slams into it, it kind of um, cushions it. And they also have uh, their tongue wraps around their brain to provide even more cushion. So they have a really long tongue with little barbs at the end. So after they drill a hole into it to find a, a grub, they can stick their long barbed tongue out and spear it and then pull it back. But yeah, their, their tongue wraps around their brain, which is uh, very strange, yes. So the digestive system of birds, once you get all those, those insects, you don't want to carry a belly full of insects around with you uh, because again, um, weight is death if you're a bird. You, you don't want to be weighed down by food. So the digestive system in birds is incredibly efficient. There is a crop for storing food, but it's going to be um, fairly small compared to other storage um, compartments and other animals. And then they're gonna have a very small intestine that can absorb nutrients incredibly rapidly. 
And so you can have a, an insect meal go through a woodpecker's body in uh, less than an hour. And from, you know, from eating to excretion, they're, they're passing waste incredibly quickly. The proventriculus is going to secrete some gastric juices to kind of get the digest, digesting, digestion going. And then the gizzard is for um, crunching. So again, we see the storage compartment and the mechanical digesting compartment. But uh, the gizzard, unlike a crayfish, which has gastric teeth, and unlike a uh, mammals, which have mouth teeth, the birds don't have any kind of calcified things to crunch food up. So what they do is they swallow a bunch of rocks, and those get lodged in the gizzard, and then the muscular gizzard grinds the food up with these rocks. And so kind of functionally the same thing, but they, they just get their crunchy stuff from the outside environment, which is pretty, pretty brilliant. So uh, small, small, small intestine, small, large intestine, and then a cloaca to expel the waste. The cica of animals usually harbors symbiotic bacteria, right, to digest cellulose. So in herbivorous species, this serves as a fermentation chamber for the bacteria to metabolize the, the cellulose. But in, um, in, most an, in most birds who are insectivores or predators, this is going to be much smaller. Last night, there was an incident. At this point, with so many crew members murdered and so few of us left, it's becoming increasingly apparent that someone is uh, killing us and everybody is, is very concerned about who it might be. And last night, Dave and Vector and the captain made a decision that it was Charlie, that Charlie was the murderer who had planned out this intricate, exquisite, um, dastardly plot to um, prevent his relationship with Isabella from becoming known to the captain. If you remember, one of Dr. Cordiceris's defenses was to, to, to blame Isabella for it because uh, Dr. Astronomer was facilitating their, their secret trysts. Um, and this is, this is appalling to me. But last night, uh, the three of them came over and uh, we, we got into a, a very heated argument. And uh, Charlie vehemently denies any wrongdoing. But the, the captain and Dave and Vector presenting the evidence that he had motivation as an android. He has the capability, then the knowledge, and then also that he's using a toxin that is not even effective against um, him or me. Um, but he could potentially put f put a trachotoxin in everybody's food, and everybody would die except except him um, him and me. And this makes the crew very very worried. Um, tensions were. Um, increasingly high, and they were becoming very, very hostile. Eventually, uh, the captain pulled his uh, laser pistol and pointed it right at Charlie. At that moment, Isabella burst into the room. She had been left out of this uh, little hostile encounter for obvious reasons by the captain, and she uh, made a, a very convincing appeal that Charlie was innocent, that uh, her meetings with him and um, Dr. Mastrom were facilitating that. That wasn't really that big of a deal, and she didn't really care if the captain knew. And uh, Charlie um, confirmed this. It really wasn't that big of a deal. But the captain's mind was made up, and as he became increasingly belligerent, Charlie matched his belligerence with his own, and um, conflict was at hand. Uh, the captain raised his gun, and fired his laser pistol right at Charlie. But as soon as he fired, Isabella, her heart full of love for, um, her, for her dear Charlie, dove in front of the gun, uh, trying to block the, the laser blast. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a laser gun, uh, which so the, the beam travels fast, as fast as the speed of light. So Isabella was woefully um, uh, slow uh, to respond, and Charlie was hit. Um, thankfully, Charlie just got hit in the shoulder, um, which, as you know, everyone has one expendable sh shoulder you can get shot in uh, with no uh, long-term negative consequences. And so Charlie's going to be fine, but Isabella, during her reckless uh, but brave um, sacrificial launch, 
Um, she landed and hit her head on a corner of our metal table, um, smashed her, her skull, and uh, was just ble bleeding, 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 bleeding. It was, it was, it was tough to see. The, the captain rushed over, um, his, uh, his tears uh, streaming down his face, just heartbroken that his, his blind um, desire for justice had led to this moment with his, with his poor sweet daughter being uh, sacrificing her life for an ultimately fruitless gesture and then slamming her head into, into the corner of a metal table. The captain um, immediately just... Um, said, I need some time to figure this out, and he um, activated the uh, quarantine protocol and sent everybody to their own quarters. So at this point, um, Isabella's with the captain in the, the medical um, uh, chamber in a little metapod, keeping her alive, uh, but I'm worried she's going to have pretty significant brain damage. And um, all, of, all of the rest of the crew are in our own individual quarters. Vector in his, Dave in his, um, me and mine and Charlie in his. So for, for now, the captain, I think, is just taking some time to evaluate priorities and come to a decision about Charlie, um, and uh, I hope he makes the right one.